Partly, again, because I think that the idea that the government or any other yeah. institution should regulate the content of your speech is absolutely un it's intolerable. I think you have a strong legal argument, right? So the government probably shouldn't mandate this. That, I'm sure a lot of people might agree with that. I'm still curious, though, in this hypothetical scenario that a student did or a person did approach you and they told you they would be harmed or they would be uncomfortable unless you referred to them with a certain pronoun, what would you do? Well, I really have a hard time answering questions like that mm -hmm. because they're asked in the hypothetical. It could certainly and happen though. It could, yeah. it could, but my sense, because I'm a clinician, is that I generally handle those sorts of things at the level of actual detail. Mm -hmm. So I would say it would depend on the person, it would depend on the situation, it would depend on why they asked me, it would depend on how they asked me, it would depend on what I thought they were trying to accomplish by the request. It would, it would depend on whether or not they were filming me while they were asking me. It would depend on whether they mm -hmm. asked me in my office or in a hallway. You know, I can tell the difference between a genuine plea for understanding and a bit of political theater or political manipulation. Hmm. Now, and I've dealt with people who've made all sorts of requests of me, believe me, because I've had a clinical practice for about 20 years, and my experience with, with a range of human behavior is, I would say, extraordinarily extensive. And so I've made all sorts of adjustments to the way I interact with people. So I can't say exactly what I would do in a given situation because I firmly believe that the devil is in the details. Sure. And I haven't been making a case about a, a specific interaction that I had actually uh, experienced or, yeah. or, 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 yeah, experienced. I've been making a case, a philosophical, fundamentally yeah. a philosophical case, and, and secondarily a political case, and I think that I've made the case properly. But you would so, say that you I recognize mean, a difference between a like legal responsibility to do something versus a sort of an individual personal choice, I should do something, well, right? Well, sometimes I recognize that. I mean, sometimes yeah. the legal and the philosophical and the personal issue are all the same. It's simpler when that's the case. Mm -hmm. But I also think that the issue is essentially a red herring. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, since I made that video for one reason or another, the things that I've been saying have become quite popular and, and not as controversial as you might think. Mo most mm -hmm. of what I've accrued so far has been support. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that has very little to do with the issue of pronouns. The, the pronoun issue and the pronoun controversy is a pointer to something that's a lot larger, and that's why this issue has had legs. I'm not here because people are interested in my views on pronouns. Mm -hmm. Now, I happen to put my foot down, so to speak, at a particular place, because it's very frequently the case that if you're engaged in a complex philosophical dispute, which is the case for our society in general, then in order to make a, to make a statement about it, you have to make a statement in relationship to an actual cause. So you have to draw the line somewhere, and people have asked me, well, why did you pick the pronoun hill to die on? And my answer to that generally is, A, I didn't die, and B, you have to... <laughs> And B, you have to you have to pick something real yeah. to to enter into the debate. So, for sure. example, if I would have just made another video decrying political correctness, it would have gone nowhere at all. Mm -hmm. But I said that there was something I wouldn't do, and one of the things I won't do is use the made-up words of postmodern neo-Marxists who are playing a particular game with gender identity that's an extension of their particular reprehensible philosophy. And if that happens mm -hmm. to mean that um, I have to engage in discussions about whether or not if a you know, if a, a, a suffering and confused person who's had, a, who's had a very, like, troubled pathway through life came and asked me politely if I would go out of my way to accommodate them, I, I think that, I don't think that those issues actually belong on the same, in the same, they're, they're not the same category of issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm, so, so I don't see that there's, well, I guess that's enough said about that. All right. Let's transition a little bit. So you mentioned sort of postmodernism and neo-Marxism. In fact, in a statement at McMaster University, you claimed that an expression uh, that the protests that you see at your events are an expression of a philosophy that's grounded partly in postmodernism and partly in Marxism. Yeah. What does that mean, first? And secondly, how would you say that these movements are characterized in those ways? Well, at McMaster, it meant that some of the protesters came with, came and hid behind a banner that had a hammer and sickle on it. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> hey, that, you know. See, see, the funny thing is, the funny thing is, is that people laugh about that, and, and I understand perfectly well why, why you're laughing. But I can tell you, you wouldn't have laughed if it would have been a swastika. Mm -hmm. And it's no, no, it's no funnier that it was a hammer and sickle. You know, the 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 the. 
reprehensible ideologies that are based in, in fundamental Marxism killed at least 100 million people in the 20th century, and they're still apologists. One in five social scientists identifies as a Marxist. It's like, really? Really? That's really, that's really where we're going to take this, is it? After the bloody 20th century. We're going to say, well, that wasn't real communism, or something foolish like that, even though we had multiple examples of exactly what happens when those doctrines are let loose in the world. And so, what, what happened in the 1960s, in the late 1960s, as far as I can tell, and this happened mostly in France, which has probably produced the, the most reprehensible coterie of public intellectuals that any country has ever managed, <laughs> is that in, in, the, in the late 1960s, when all the student activists uh, had decided that the Marxist revolution wasn't going to occur in the Western world, and, and, and had finally also realized that apologizing for the Soviet for the Soviet system mm -hmm. uh, was just not going to fly anymore, given, given the tens of millions of bodies that had stacked up, that they performed a, what I would call a philosophical sleight of hand and transformed the class war into an you know, into a identity politics, politics war. And that became extraordinarily popular, mostly transmitted through people like Jacques Derrida, who became an absolute darling of the Yale English department, and had his pernicious doctrine spread throughout North America, partly as a consequence of his invasion of Yale. And what, like happened with the, what, what happened with the postmodernists is they kept on peddling their, 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 their murderous breed of, of political doctrine under a new guise. And resentful people all over the world fell for it. And I don't, I don't consider that acceptable. I, you know, one of the things I've learned, for example, I teach my students in my second year personality class about what happened in the Soviet Union, in, in the Gulag Archipelago. And I use Solzhenitsyn as an exemplar, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, as an exemplar of existential psychology, because I think he's actually the wisest of the existential psychologists, even though he was primarily a historian and a literary figure. Mm -hmm. Well, most of the students don't even know what happened in the Soviet Union. Well, why is that, exactly? And the reason for that is that radical leftist ideologue uh, intellectuals in the West have never properly apologized for the, ro for the role they played in the, in the absolute murderousness of the, of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And so students don't even know about it, so they can come out to McMaster behind their their damnable poster with a hammer and sickle on it and act like they're virtuous. Mm -hmm. do you it's think it's that, appalling. Do you think that trend was only sort of significant to that specific McMaster incident? Or do you see this type of ideology influencing campus protests beyond McMaster in general? Well, I think, the, I think that, that part of it's, it's everywhere. It's, it's not just in campus protests. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the campuses are, are are overrun in large part with disciplines that have, in my estimation, no valid reason to exist. Hmm. I think disciplines like women's studies should be defunded. Mm -hmm. Any of the activist disciplines who, who hmm. act, who, whose primarily, primary role is the overthrow of, 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 for example, of the patriarchy, which is about as ill-defined a concept as you could possibly formulate, mm -hmm. that it's enough, that we've, we've done enough public funding of that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. We're providing, we're providing full-time, destructive employment for people who are doing nothing but causing trouble and so seriously say, nothing. You would say that because you think that these departments are causing harm or could have the potential to cause harm, that university administrations should defund them, right? No, I don't or, think no. they should okay. defund them. Who the hell cares what I think about them? Mm -hmm. That isn't why I think that they should be defunded at all. Okay. I think they should be defunded because what they promote has zero intellectual credibility. Mm -hmm. Their research methods don't qualify as research methods. Mm -hmm. Their publications, 80% of humanities publications now, garner zero citations. That's not very many citations. Mm -hmm. And it's... <laughs> <laughs> so, and the little trick, as far as I can tell, is what happens is that people write something that no one will read. They know perfectly well that no one will read it. They circulate it around their, their tiny group of compatriots who mm -hmm. occupy the same little little what a little area on the intellectual spectrum so then it's peer reviewed then it's published by major journals who sell it at inflated prices to libraries who squirreled away to and and only increase the noise to signal ratio in relationship to the sum total of human knowledge mm -hmm. it's a scam from top to bottom so and you know what one of the what here, here's an say? example mm -hmm. well let me give you an example sure. so and here's one of the things that really bothered me about what was going on in Ontario, and this is happening everywhere, and, and I, ma I made this claim when I made my first video, since we have to get into this. So the, the technical claim in, in the Ontario legisla legislation now, and this, is ha this has already happened in New York, by the way, this is not only a Canadian thing, it's happening in Australia, it's happening in New Zealand, it's happening everywhere. Here's the claim. There's biological sex, 
there's gender identity, there's gender expression, and there's sexual proclivity, and they vary independently. That's the technical claim. It's built into the Canadian law. That's not true. Not a, not a bit of that is true. The correlation between biological sex and gender identity exceeds 0.99. It's virtually perfect. It's the very definition of non-independence. So you think, almost everyone who's biologically male identifies as biologically male. Almost everyone who identifies as biologically male dresses and acts male. That's the gender identity element. And almost everybody who is biologically male, who identifies as male, who dresses as male, is in fact heterosexual. Those things are incredibly tightly linked, but the technical claim in the legislation is that they vary independently. Wrong! Now, I got in trouble well, for saying that, because what mm -hmm. people claimed was that I was denying the existence of people who don't fit neatly into the gendered categories, well, which the, I wasn't um, doing at all. What about the 0.01 or whatever the percentage may be that wouldn't fall neatly under that correlation? So, certainly if there were a perfect correlation, that would work, but if there's not, it would seem, perhaps, that you're excluding certain people. Right? So if, if most people tend to identify a certain way, but there is that 0.01 that's not... I'm sure. not, I was never denying their existence. Okay. I was denying the validity of the claim that those four levels of analysis existed independently of one another, which they don't. It's a false claim, and the reason that the, the radical social constructionists who are pursuing this line of reasoning, which is completely discredited as far as I'm mm -hmm. concerned, I don't think it's any better than claiming that the world is flat. Mm -hmm. The reason that they're pursuing it legally is because they know perfectly well that they've lost the scientific discussion. I mean, I debated someone on Canadian public television who had the gall to say that the, you know, the scientific consensus over the last four decades was that there was no biological differences between men and women. I mean, and that was I could, well, one of the things that was so absolutely absurd about that, and there were many things that were absurd about it, was that I was in trouble with the university at that point, and he wasn't. It's like, first of all, that is, that is not the scientific consensus of the last four decades. It's, it's, and, and the idea that there are no biological differences between men and women, it's the sort of thing you hear that, it just makes your jaw drop. Now, what, what you could say is that if you took all the dimensions along which men and women vary, and, and there's a substantial number of them, that there's substantial overlap between men and women on almost all of the dimensions. Now, that's not particularly true with chromosomal identity, although there are some exceptions. Like with personality, for example, and I happen to be somewhat of an expert on personality, there are marked differences between men and women, but the overlap exceeds the differences. So, for example, women are higher in agreeableness. And you might say, well, that's socio-culturally constructed, but it turns out that it isn't. Because if you look across cultures, and you, you look at the cultures that have moved most forward with, um, with gender equality provisions at the social and political le levels, and that would be the Scandinavian countries, the, the differences in personality between women, men and women maximize in those countries. And these aren't tiny studies. These are studies that involve tens of thousands of people and that have been well replicated by a series of independent researchers. And so, with per, with per, if you add the personality differences between men and women across all the personality traits, you can almost perfectly segregate men from women. And that, has not, that, that doesn't take into account the obvious things like arm angle and hip width, hip, hip width compared to, to waist width and shoulder width, and upper body strength, and height, and weight, and the biochemical differences. And I mean, it's, it's so preposterous that it's, mm -hmm. be, it's, it's beyond conception to me that we're actually even discussing it. But I was making a specific claim, which is, the law says these four levels of analysis vary independently. The only reason they're associated with one another is for cultural reasons. No. Mm -hmm. Wrong. And you don't get to put fallacious scientific truths into the law. Mm -hmm. not or if you're going to do that, then I'm not going to abide by that particular law. I'm going to object to it, which is exactly what I should be doing. So, do you think that a necessary premise for us to accept to have a law like that, a law that extends protections to these groups, is that these identities are independent from each other, fully independent? No. Or could we accept, like, if they had just justified it as, we know that these aren't fully independent, but we think there are other good reasons to provide these protections, would you be, would your stance on the law change? Well, the law, as it's currently formulated, doesn't, in fact, it undermines the protection that these sorts of groups have been pursuing and seeking for years. So let's say, let's take the, mm -hmm. let's, let's accept the proposition that these vary independently, or, or that they're only socio-culturally constructed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where does that leave your discussion of homosexuality? 
So if the, if the fundamentalist Christians say, well, if, if homosexuality is nothing but a socio-cultural construct, then why do we have to put up with it? It's a perfectly valid argument. They say, well, no, you know, people, people are born into their sexual proclivity. Now, I'm not saying that they are or not, because I, I'm not making either of those sure. cases. What I am pointing out is that the legislation and policies of that sort, as currently formulated, actually undermine the very arguments that many of the activist groups have been using to promote the fact that they, they are, that they're deserving, let's say, that they're deserving of their, of their non-standard identity, that the non-standard identity is justifiable. If your sexual proclivity is nothing but a whim, then why should I put up with it? Hmm. No, I, it's perfectly reasonable for me to say, no, well, we'll just reshape it, because you're, inf you're infinitely malleable. Now, you know, it, it isn't exactly, we don't exactly know the degree to which such things as, let's say, sexual identity and sexual proclivity are biologically predicated or socio-culturally instantiated. Mm -hmm. But when you, when you put forward legislation that insists on one to the exclusion of the other, you better be careful, because you're going to be hooked hooked in your own noose. And so when I read through the legislation and the policies that surrounded it, I thought, this isn't going to protect the people that it's supposed to protect. But it doesn't matter, because the legislation was never designed to protect people. It was designed to advance a certain kind of political agenda, mm -hmm. which is partly why I'm object objecting to it. Mm -hmm. So and I'm not willing in the slightest to presume that just because activist groups with this postmodern neo-Marxist ethic stand up and say, well, we're on the side of the oppressed, that that makes them A, on the side of the oppressed, or B, virtuous. I don't buy either of those arguments. I don't think they stand for what they say they stand for. I don't think they're promoting a doctrine that's going to do what they claim it will do. I don't believe that they're good and the rest of the world bad. I don't buy their oppressor-victim dichotomy. Hmm. I don't admire their philosophical position. I think they don't know anything about history, or if they do know anything about history, then they're malevolent for pursuing hmm. exactly the same policies that led us into terrible situations before. So, In what ways do you think the policies that are being advocated, and maybe you could talk a bit about the particular harms you think that this Canadian bill would have, even if we don't accept the theoretical or political or historical rationale for the bill, could it be that it still produces good consequences? Or do you think that there's even a consequentialist argument against this sort of bill? And if so, what do you think the Well, the letters that I've received from the transsexual people I described mm -hmm. indicate instantly that it's not producing positive, positive effects at all. Mm -hmm. They said, after saying, well, our political views aren't homogenous, and we don't like being treated as if they were, and these activists don't speak for us, they say, look, most of us would just like to be a little bit more invisible if we could. Hmm. And all this terrible concentration on preferred pronouns and, and identification of transsexual people has made our lives a living hell. Mm -hmm. Well, and no so, wonder, because it's hard. You imagine, you're, imagine that you are having real trouble with your gender identity, you know, and you're a six foot one guy and you want to transform yourself into a woman. Mm -hmm. It's going to be hard enough for you to be, you know, quasi invisible in a socially acceptable mm -hmm. way without a bunch of people who purport to be speaking on your behalf, making this like issue du jour for their political reasons. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what the letter writers have been telling me. Mm -hmm. so, so, no, I, I, don't, I don't see that, I mean, the, the legislation is, was incoherent as originally formulated, then it was made worse by its shopping before activist groups. There's no evidence whatsoever that it'll have the outcomes that the, that the people who formulated it hypothetically desire, because I don't mm -hmm. believe that they desire the best possible outcome anyways. The people, look, the people who are formulating these sorts of policies state quite forthrightly. So, for example, if you go look at women's studies websites, they state quite forthrightly that their aim is the destruction of the patriarchy, whatever the hell that is. You know, I mean, and that, that, that's a good indication of the level of intellectual sophistication that goes into this sort of thinking. What is this patriarchy mm -hmm. exactly? Well, what is it exactly? I mean, if we're going to talk about it, it it's, it's male domination of everything and nothing but oppression. It's like, really, that's how we're going to define our society, is it? Mm. Compared to what society, exactly? Where have people been more free than they are, for example, in this country? Now, that doesn't mean they're perfectly free, but, mm. you know, forget that. That's never going to happen. It's like, well, this is an oppressive place compared to my hypo the hypothetical utopia that I would produce if I happened to be, you know, uh, Stalin for a week. And as I've, as, I've, as, I've, as I've already pointed out, if you were the, the hypothetical um, altruistic utopian of your imagination, mm -hmm. then the people right behind you in your bloody revolution would stab you to death in your bed, and you wouldn't get to make your, your decisions mm -hmm. for the benefit of anyone ever, anyways. So, so 
how do you think progress should be made in a world where we are freer than we have ever been? Do you think we, like when are there changes that are desirable to be made and how would you want to see them implemented if not through policy or through activism the way that certain groups currently are promoting? Well, back, you know, this happened in the 60s as far as I can mm -hmm. tell that we got this misbegotten idea that the way to conduct yourself as a, as a responsible human being was to hold placards up to protest to change the viewpoints of other people and thereby usher in the utopia. It's like, I think, I think that's all appalling. I think it's appalling and, and I think it's absolutely, it's, it's absolutely absurd that students are taught that that's the way to conduct mm -hmm. themselves in the world. First of all, if you're 19 or 20 or 21, you don't bloody well know anything. You haven't done anything. <laughs> you don't know anything about history. You haven't read anything. You haven't supported yourself for any length of time. You've been entirely dependent on your state and on your family. For the, for the brief few years of your existence, and the idea that you have enough wisdom to determine how society should be reconstructed, when you're sitting in the absolute lap of luxury, protected by, mm -hmm. by, by processes that you don't understand, is absolutely, I mean, it's... Mm. Okay, so that's a bad, let's call that a bad idea, sure. shall we? <laughs> and, then we and then the idea that what you should do to change the world is to find people who you disagree with and shake paper on sticks at them and call them names is mm. also, and, and it's a, and that you, you do that before you go out for, here, I'll, I'll tell you how serious the activists are. This is something that's just unbelievably comical as far as I'm concerned. So some of you may know that um, I participated in a debate on free speech, so-called debate at free speech that the University of Toronto hosted. Um, it turned into a forum and, and, and whatever that is, but it's certainly not a debate. But one of the things I did when I was talking to the university administration was to suggest how they might deal with the possibility of protesters. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, that's easy. I know how you can have absolutely zero protesters. Um, have it in the morning. They won't get out of bed in a tent. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. So we had it at 9 o'clock in the morning, and there was one MP, P, a me member of parliament, who showed up to hand out some pamphlets, not a single protester. So it's like, if you want a controversial speaker on campus, just have it at 7 in the morning. You won't get a protester within 50 yards of it, because they'll still be sleeping off last night's hot and alcohol-induced hangover. <laughs> so, so, you know, and the question was, what uh, do I think people should do? And yeah. I'll, I'll tell you something that's been very interesting to me, and I can see it reflected here. The first thing I've noticed is that um, when I started putting my videos on YouTube, which was about three years ago, I noticed that about 85% of the people that were watching them were men. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's pretty weird because about 80% of my students are women, you know, because mm -hmm. men are bailing out of universities like mad, and there won't be one in the social sciences and humanities left in 10 years, but, you know, <laughs> nobody seems particularly worried about that. You can go look that up online if you want and look at the enrollment curves and just project them 10 years out into the future. And I've been following that for about 20 years. But one of the things, but online it was, so it was 85% men. I thought, wow, that's really weird and strange. And then I made these political videos and then it popped up to 91% men. And then I've noticed in the audiences that I've gone to talk to that it's almost all men. Now just look around here, man. It's like, what, it's got to be 90% guys in this audience. And I thought, what the hell's going on? It's weird. And I noticed that at the first free speech debate at the University of Toronto. I made a point of it. I walked into the room and I thought, wow, these are all men. So I had the men stand up and the women stand up. And I used that as an example of the fact that maybe men and women have different interests. It was, you know, just an ad hoc demonstration. But it's really been borne out by the demographic analysis of my viewers. And I have, you know, about 8 million views or something like that now. So it's a pretty big population. Mm -hmm. I've been talking nonstop about personal responsibility and about the fact that if you want to change the world, you should bloody well get your act together and quit whining and sniveling about how horrible everything is and about how people owe you more rights and more privileges. And for some reason, that seems to be a message that's really resonating among young men. And I think the reason for that, first of all, I think young women have enough to do. And so that's perhaps part of the reason why the message isn't as necessary mm -hmm. for them. They're trying to juggle career. They're trying to figure out how to have a family. And they don't really have any question about whether or not that's useful and proper. So they're off doing that and, and whatever else they're doing. But young men seem to have more of a choice about that, and many of them are essentially bailing out. And it's partly because I think they've been well punished for their virtues. And so I talked to young guys in particular about 
you know, adopting some responsibility and mm -hmm. trying to straighten out their lives and to bear the load of being properly and to forthrightly move through existence and to become a credit to themselves and their community. And that's what you should do instead of waving cards at someone telling them to behave more properly because you're morally superior to mm -hmm. them. So, and for some reason that message, which is, it's a really, it's not the sort of message that you would expect to sell. Right, it's the exactly the opposite of something that you would consider saleable. But mm -hmm. my experience has been that the young men, in particular, are so bloody desperate for that message that they can hardly stand themselves. And and it's no wonder because it's a call to it's a call to proper being. It's a call to heroic being, and it's a call for people to adopt their individual responsibility and to straighten themselves out and to find out what they could be like if they took on the burdens of existence, like like respectable, well-educated, articulate, powerful people. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's to the benefit of everyone. Yeah. And so, well, so that's where the responsibility lies. And I'm not interested in, look, I've thought for many, many years, decades really, about having a political career. I mean, I was interested mm -hmm. in the political career when I was 13. And so every five years or so, I've probably revisited that. But every time I revisited, I came to the same conclusion, which was that the, the work that I was doing that was focused on a philosophy of individual responsibility and trying to identify how that philosophy had emerged in the West over thousands of years was more important than any possible political action could be. Mm -hmm. And I still don't regard what I'm doing as political in any sense of the word. I think, it's, I think it's philosophical most accurately and there's an element of it that's theological. Mm -hmm. so, so, so I think it's individual responsibility. And the yeah. meaning of life is to be found in the adoption of individual responsibility. Mm -hmm. And that's what the university should be teaching people. So, Dr. Peterson, you mentioned these ideas of responsibility, of virtue, of respect. You've, I think, detailed what you think students shouldn't do in these examples of like protests and these examples of certain types of activist tactics. What advice would you have for students? How can students make the changes that they want to make? Particularly, do you have any advice for students here? Yeah, read great books. Mm -hmm. Really, man. You've got this four-year period that, that has been carved out of your lives by society. They, they, it, it, it's given you an identity, like a high-quality identity, and freedom at the same time. And you're not going to get that again in your life. You've got, a, you've got a respectable identity, university student, and complete freedom associated with that, or as near as you're ever going to get. And you've got these unbelievable libraries that are full of the writings of people mm -hmm. who, are, who are intelligent and articulate beyond comprehension. And, you know, and, and you can go there and you can learn all this. And you might think, well, why should you learn it? Um, well, you, you learn it to get a job, or you learn it to pe get good grades, or you learn it to get a degree. And that's all nonsense. It's nonsense. The reason that you come to university to be educated is because there is nothing more powerful than someone who is articulate and who can think and speak. It's power. And I mean power of the best sort. It's authority and influence and respectability and competence. And so you come to university to craft your highest skill. And your highest skill is to be found in articulated speech. And if you're, if, you're, if you're a master at formulating your arguments, you win everything. And better than that, when you win everything, everyone around you wins too. Because to transform yourself into, let's consider, consider your transformation into something approximating the logos, it means you shine a light on the whole world. Well, there's nothing more exciting to do than that. There's nothing better you can possibly do. And to think that you're coming to university to be, you know, trained to have a job, it's like, great, that's a hell of a lot better than being unemployed and covered with Cheeto dust while you're <laughs> snacking away in front of your video game in the basement. But it's not, it's not a, and I don't have anything against video games, by the way. But, it, it, <laughs> but it's hardly a triumphant call to, to being in the world. And that's what universities should be calling forth. It's like, God, you people, you, you know, I, I know what Harvard students are like. I taught here for five years. You people are spectacular. You're spectacular. You, you're, you're, you're all capable of being world beaters. You transform yourself into something that's articulated and sensible and grounded in history and knowledgeable and wise, man. You can do anything you want and hopefully anything you want for good. Because if you have any sense, everything you want to do would be for the good. Because there's nothing more compelling or meaningful or or useful in combating the tragedy of life than to, than to struggle with all your soul on behalf of the good. And the universities have forgotten that. It's why everyone's bailing out of the humanities. And they should. The humanities are corrupt. And they're corrupt because they're not telling students this. It's so bloody obvious. It's like, learn to think. 
learn to speak, learn to read. It makes you a superpower, an individual superpower. You have, it, it, and I don't understand why that isn't just told to students. It's not that hard to understand, and everyone wants to hear it. It's like, really, I could do that? I could do that? It's like, yeah, really, you could do that. And the whole society around you has labored for really thousands of years to provide every single one of you with this spectacular opportunity that you have while you're undergraduates and graduate students here. Mm -hmm. Man, they're just, everyone's just praying that you would come here and manifest everything that you could manifest. And that's what you should be doing instead of waving placards and complaining about how you're oppressed, for God's sake. You see these Yale students complaining about their oppression. It's just, it just leaves me aghast. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, we're against the ruling class. It's like, no, 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 you're baby ruling class <laughs> members. You're young. <laughs> The only reason you're not rich is because you're young. You know, that's the best, really, that's the, if you look at the 1%, even, the, the dreaded 1%, you know, most of those people are old. Why? Well, when you progress through life, if you're reasonably successful, you trade in your promising youth for your wealthy old age, but you're still bloody old. Would you, <laughs> would you trade it? Would you trade your youth for that? Like if you factor age out of the economic equation, things look a lot different. Well, of course older people have more money. If they have any sense, they've been collecting it for their whole life. Is that somehow unfair? It's not unfair unless you want to want to be poverty stricken when you're 70. And you, and you don't want to be poverty stricken, po poverty stricken when you're 70. So I just don't understand what's happened to the universities. I can't mm -hmm. believe that you're not told when you come the first day, look, man, you are on, you're here on a heroic mission you're going to take your capacity to articulate yourself to levels that are undreamed of. You're going to come out of here unstoppable. You're going to be able to do anything you want. It's like, that's what you're here for. Mm -hmm. Instead, you're taught that, well, you know, the world's a pretty oppressive place, and you're probably the bottom of the victim pile, and, 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 there's, and there's, oh, there's virtually nothing you can do about it except, you know, deconstruct the patriarchy. And it's so weak deed and so pathetic that, that, that universities should be embarrassed that that's what they're peddling to students. I'm embarrassed by it. You know, I've, I've gone on public record telling parents, bloody well send your boys to trade school because at least they'll learn something useful. Mm. And that's a terrible thing for someone like me to say because I do believe that, the art, that being articulated and educated in the highest possible manner is there's nothing that's better for you and for society. Mm -hmm. And why, are the, why have the universities forgotten this? Well, that's postmodern neo-Marxism for you, you know. <laughs> that then the philosophy of intense resentment and oppression mm. and group identity and God, it's just mm. pathetic. Dr. Peterson, I think a lot of students here would agree with you that one of the main purposes of uh, education at college, particularly at Harvard, is to develop their sense of articulation, their ability to read, their ability to crit uh, critically think. But then what comes after? Particularly at Harvard, there's a big discussion on what is a good life? What does it mean to use those skills that we get here and then we graduate? What do we do from there? Stop, and I think, stop mm -hmm. unnecessary suffering. Mm -hmm. That's what you do. You know, that, so, that, that's your mm -hmm. calling. It's like you say, well, what do you do after you graduate? Well, if you graduate articulated and powerful, Mm -hmm. There will be people giving you so many opportunities, you won't even be able to keep up with them. You know, and, and, and I've worked with comp very, very competent people in many different domains in my life, hyper-competent people. And I can tell you some very interesting things about hyper-competent people. The first thing is they are not selfish and they're not greedy. And one of the great pleasures in their lives is to find people who have the capacity to also be hyper-competent and to open doors for them as rapidly as they can possibly be opened. They delight in that, because there is, there's nothing, there's, there's very few things that are more intrinsically meaningful mm -hmm. if you're an accomplished person than to find young people who have the possibility of being accomplished and say, hey, look, here's an opportunity for you. It's like, go out there, man, kill it. And then they go out there and kill it, and you think, right on, man. Here's another opportunity. Why don't you go out there and nail that, too? And you think, no, no, they're all hoarding their wealth, and they're not going to share it with anyone. It's like, that's absolute, complete rubbish. Mm -hmm. And so you don't even have to worry about what you're going to do after you graduate from here if you, if you turn yourself into half of what you could be, because people will be dying to offer you every opportunity that you can possibly make use of. So it's, it's, it's a moot point. The, the, the world is always desperately short of people who can think and speak. 
And, and you think, well, I, that, I won't be made use of. Well, you, first of all, you can't say that if you're, at, if, if you're at Harvard, for God's sake. I mean, people already figured out who you are. They've already figured it out. And they're offering you the world on a, on a gold platter. They take it. It's yours. Mm -hmm. Take it. It's like, great, man. Put mm -hmm. yourself together and deserve it. That would be great. And that's what everyone wants. It's what your parents want. It's also what you want. You know it. It's what you want. It's what men, it's what women want from men. It's what men want from women. It's like for you to be who you could be. And, and the highest faculty of the human being is articulated speech. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's the divine faculty. And there is nothing more powerful than that. There's nothing that's mm -hmm. even in the same league. And so if you, if you don't have faith in that, then, you're, then your priorities are misplaced. And I, I can't even understand why you wouldn't have faith in that being, say, Harvard students, because look where it's got you already. You know, you're already sitting on top of the world. So make, deserve it, make use of it, mm -hmm. right? Go out there and fix things up. That's what you need to do. There's lots of things that need to be fixed up. And what you want to do is burden yourself with so much responsibility that you can barely stand. And then you'll get stronger trying to lift it up. And you won't be asking, what should I be doing with my life? Or what's the meaning of life? Or any of that. It'll be self-evident. Mm -hmm. It's self-evident. At minimum, you can say, there's more suffering in the world than there should be, and I could probably do something about that. And you mm -hmm. can do something about that. So go do something about it. And then there'll be less suffering in the world. And then when you're 80, you can look back on your life and say, well, you know, there's less suffering in the world than there, than there would have been had I not existed. Mm -hmm. and, and you don't have to even have a, a sense of, of ultimate destiny or even any sort of theistic belief mm -hmm. to regard that as a positive good. Like, I think it goes beyond... The, the mere pragmatic utility of addressing the world's ills, because I think we do live in a, in, a, in a world that has a transcendent reality as well as the reality that we can detect. But even independently of that, it doesn't matter. Hmm. It's like, I mean, this is part of the reason I like people, like Bill Gates is a great example, man. That guy, hmm. is, he's after five major diseases at the same time, right? He's trying to wipe out polio. He's trying to wipe out... Um, malaria, yeah, exactly. He's trying to wipe out malaria. It's like... Well, what should you do with your life? Well, you know, take a look at Bill Gates and see if you could do something like that. Mm. That would be good. <laughs> so. so Dr. Peterson, you talk about this idea of ending unnecessary suffering and this idea of committing one's life to that. At a minimum. I mean, that's at just an obvious yeah. thing that you could do. A lot of students, I think, accept that premise and view what they're doing as trying to eliminate or reduce unnecessary suffering, and they see activism or other forms of direct service as fulfilling that goal. Do you simply disagree with like the content of what they think, the, the tactic that they are using to end unnecessary suffering, or do you think that their motives or their intentions are not even the same as yours? It's too public. You know, there's this, there's, this old, there's this old saying from the, from the New Testament about not praying in public, hmm. right? And the idea is that if you're going to commune for the higher good, you should do it in private, because otherwise you're warping your ethic in some sense by demonstrating how virtuous you, virtuous you are to the world. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, I'm, you go out there with a stick and a sign on it that says, I'm against poverty. It's like, yeah, no kidding, man. <laughs> really. Like, who's, who's for poverty? No one's for poverty. So it's, 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 it's an abdication of responsibility with the mask of social virtue. Mm -hmm. You want to solve a difficult problem is you figure out how to get along with your brother, the one you've been fighting with for mm -hmm. five years, or see if you can staple your family back together. See if you can stop fighting with your girlfriend and have a relationship that lasts for more than two weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like there are things that you should be doing in the confines of your own life that are private and humble. That would, that would constitute genuine accomplishments, and those are the things that you should attend to. And no one's going to come along and say, hey, you know, good job, you're, you're changing the world. Because it's, it's private, but mm. it's real, and, and people don't do that. And so, no, I don't, I don't, trust, the activist, I, I don't trust the activist ethos at all. Hmm. I, think it, I think everything about it is, is superficial and, mm. and trendy and, and too easy and... And it externalizes the blame. The evil is always elsewhere, which mm. is a dreadful mistake to make, because the evil isn't elsewhere. That's, that's the thing that you understand when you're wise, hmm. is the evil is not elsewhere. It's you, because you're not everything you could be. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you should work on that before going and telling someone else that maybe they're not who they should be. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, 
you know, I, so I don't buy it. It's too easy. It's far too easy. And it's too public. Mm -hmm. And it's too self-congratulatory. And then there's the murderous, like, Marxist element, which, you know, I'm always often inclined to mention. So certainly, I think, you've identified certain causes where the public element of trying to do good or the self-congratulatory version of trying to do good could be harmful. But do you think there are cases, for instance, I'm thinking of policy, influencing policy, being a policymaker. It seems like something like that, public policy, could be used to eliminate some unnecessary suffering, but would involve a more public domain, something where you are trying to attract followers, trying to attract praise from other people. Look, look, if, mm -hmm. you've, if you've established yourself in the world as a credible human being, mm -hmm. and people are asking you to enter public service because of your accomplishments, then it's time to do it. Hmm. Right. But before that, it's a little on the premature side. Mm -hmm. And if you're just setting yourself for forward as an avatar of an, ideo of an ideology, then there's nothing to you except I think of it as the chattering of various forms of demons. It's like you're not helpful. And if you, if you look, you want to think, okay, are you fit to lead? Yeah. Let's, let's put it that way. Okay, first of all, do you know where you're going? Because that's actually one of the hallmarks of a leader. A leader knows where he's going, and maybe other people are also interested in going that way. Mm -hmm. But the leaders I've met have carved themselves out a personal vision. Right? Mm -hmm. It's not some, some cookie-cutter ideological solution to the ills of the planet. They've done a detailed analysis, right? They know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. And they're usually people, well, they've had a successful relationship. They've had a successful family. They have a couple of degrees. They've established a business. Like, mm -hmm. they've made themselves credible in five or six dimensions. Well, then maybe you know enough about the world to dare to mess with its internal mechanisms. And if you, if you don't have that kind of in-depth knowledge, then you should just, you shouldn't, you should no more work on the economic systems of mm -hmm. Western civilization than you should try to adjust the electronic systems of your automobile, because the latter is far less complex than the former. So of course there's utility in policy formulation and in, in government service and in all of those sorts mm -hmm. of things. But you have to, you have to have transformed yourself, at least to some degree, into someone who's actually competent before mm -hmm. you should even dare to do such things. You think, well, I've read some Marx and now I know how to change the world. It's like... Mm -hmm. <laughs> That, that's a very bad idea, because yeah. the probability that you're going to take something complex that doesn't work too badly and fix it with your idiotic intervention is zero. Mm -hmm. So... Hmm. Well put. <laughs> <laughs> you talked a little bit about this idea of signaling virtue, and one thing that I thought about a lot of activist causes, ones you might characterize as self-congratulatory, seem to emphasize concepts like validation and affirmation. In your experience, either as a professor, as a psychologist, do you think that this is an example of virtue signaling and perhaps provide like a definition of virtual, virtue signaling first? Or do you think there is some value in these types of principles or these types of interactions? I don't think there's any value in those principles mm -hmm. at, at all. I mean, I can say, well, I think you're a really good guy. Oh, you know, yes. yeah, yeah. Dr. And I mean, no, at, at, at most, that's, uh, well, first of all, it's cheap and easy. That was easy. <laughs> and, and now I'm a, I'm a good guy because, you know, I'm perfectly willing to affirm you. It's like, mm -hmm. everyone has a problem, let's say, with self affirmation. This is why mm -hmm. I hate that word, but I'll use it temporarily. Um, this is part of the reason why I'm an ad admirer of part, in part, of the existential philosophers and psychologists. Hmm. Because one of the points they made is that, well, human beings are flawed creatures. We, we have tragic lives, we're very, very vulnerable, and so it's very easy for us to despise ourselves and to, and to, and to, and to, be, and to despise and have contempt for humanity itself. Mm -hmm. And there are reasons for that. We're, we're weak, we're flawed, we're malevolent, we don't last very long, we're not very attractive, we have, we have an endless litany of faults, both as a species and as individuals. Well, so, so you're stuck with that, that's just part of being itself, it's built into the fabric of being. Hmm. So what do you do about that? Well, you don't go around waiting for someone to tell you what a you know, good person hmm. you are. That's not, first of all, it's not believable, it's not helpful. Hmm. That doesn't mean you should be tormenting people into a sense of even more fallibility than they already have, that's not, clearly that's not helpful. But the way that you develop an, an, uh, 
a sense of respect for yourself, which is a better way of thinking about it, or respect for humanity, for that matter, which is much better than thinking about it as an affirmation, mm -hmm. is to bear up under the damn load. And then you can recognize yourself as something that's flawed, but that can tolerate the flaw, and that can work towards alleviating it. And that's, that's the pathway to the transcendence of tragedy, which is a much, like, compared to affirmation, it's like, it's... You're giving a starving, you're giving a thirsty person dust to drink. Hmm. There's nothing to it. You mm -hmm. know, people, it, 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 people have to commit to being in order to withstand their own vulnerability and fragility and, and essentially flawed nature. Mm -hmm. The way that you tolerate that is to, the way you stand up underneath that is to adopt responsibility for it. Mm -hmm. And then your pathway is clear. Then you can tolerate who you are. Mm -hmm. And then you won't hate humanity. Because people hate humanity. You hear the environmentalists, the radical environmentalists, say such things. I've heard people say this. The planet would be better off without people on it. It's like, well, let's keep you away from the hydrogen bombs, <laughs> shall we? You know, and people think that's a virtuous statement. The planet would be better off without people on it. It's like, oh, really? That's, that's what you're saying? It's like, I see. You don't think it's OK to be racially genocidal, but it's perfectly fine to just wipe out all of them. That's OK, as long as you're not selective about it. Mm -hmm. So. We, we, we're, we're, we're nourishing people, we're nourishing young people on nothing. Hmm. It's nothing. It's like they're suffering. And no wonder, because life is suffering. Right? Hmm. That's the first thing you learn if you're on the road to wisdom. Life is suffering. Hmm. Right. And is it someone's fault? Yeah. Sure. It's society's fault. It's your fault. It's nature's fault. It's God's fault. It's like, yeah, the fault's everywhere, man. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to do about that? Hmm. Bear up under it. And do something useful. And then you can respect yourself, at least to some degree. At least you're not contributing to the problem. Yeah. You know, and then maybe you can start to see the beauty in life and the possibility in life and the majesty in life and the, and the, and the in, incredible capacity of human beings for self-transformation. Mm -hmm. Here, here's an example. We've, we've learned this relatively recently mm -hmm. in, at a neurobiological level. You know, so there, there's been an idea, a psychological idea, that, that's floated around for quite a long time, a clinical idea that you expand your character by aggregating diverse experiences, right? It's sort of, you journey everywhere to become who you are. And you can think about that from, from a Piagetian perspective, a, a constructivist perspective, and say, well, the more places you journey to in the world, the more information you expose yourself to, and then you take in that information and inform yourself with it, and you, you develop yourself because you're more differentiated and you have a more differentiated view of the world. It's like, the, the basic idea is the world is a pool of information that you can use to construct yourself out of and to construct the world. Mm -hmm. And that's a lovely d doctrine, and I, I believe it to be the case. Mm -hmm. But there's more to it than that. You know, we, we know now that if you take someone and you put them in a radically new situation, that new genes turn on in their, in their brain at the, micro, at, the, at, the, mm. at, the, at the at the micro level. New, yeah. g new, new genetic structures code for new proteins mm. and build new structures. It's like you're actually a pool of biological possibility. And the only way that you can determine the full extent of that, of that pool, of the possibility of that pool, is by pushing yourself out against the world. And that will physiologically transform you. And we have no idea what the limits to that are. We know in clinical psychology that you know, what you do with people is expose them to the things that they're afraid of and are avoiding. And you don't make them less afraid by doing that. You make them braver. That's mm -hmm. why it generalizes. Right? They don't come out saying, oh, the world's safe. It's like, once you've learned that the world is safe, not safe, there is no going back. That's the post-traumatic stress disorder conundrum. Hmm. There's no going back. But what you can learn is, yes, the world is terribly dangerous, far more dangerous than you think. And people are far more malevolent than you likely have the imagination to, to conceptualize. But there is way more to you than you know. Mm -hmm. And if you wouldn't look for safe spaces and retreat, if you would push out in the world and accept your responsibility and, and confront your limitations, then you would discover all sorts of things about you that you have no idea about. And then you would transform into something that's far more than what you are. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's in that process of continual transformation that you'll actually find the essential meaning of life. So, and again, this is, it, it's, not like, it's not like we don't know this. Everyone knows this. Mm -hmm. So... And the universities, in some sense, are supposed to remind you of this. But they've abdicated their responsibility, as far as I'm concerned, and in many cases are working counterproductively. They're trying to teach young people that they're, that they're helpless victims 
who need to restructure society in order I don't know, I can't even say it anymore. It's so, it's so empty and dead. It's, 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 mm. it's, it's, uh, you know, I, I, I think I read this in, in uh, Elias Kennedy in a book called Crowds and Power, and it was one of the things that really stuck in my imagination. He did an etymological analysis of the word slogan, and he said that it was derived from the Welsh, uh, two words, sluag, S-L-U-A-G-H, and garm. G-H-A-I-R-M, and it meant battle cry of the dead. And that really struck me, because I, I've, I've always had this sense that people mouthing ideologies are the puppets of corpses, it's something like that, the puppets of corpses of malevolent philosophers. You know, and they speak in dead tones, and they're not interesting, like if you're listening to an ideologue rattle on, you can hardly concentrate on what they're saying, because it's dead, it's death itself speaking, and, and it, it compels zero interest. And so even discussing this sort of thing, I find difficult to even formulate the, the words, because I'm so tired of that, kind, mm -hmm. of, that realm of that realm of discourse. It's like, mm -hmm. we, there's so many tremendous things that are remaining in the world for people to do, mm -hmm. if they stop being dead puppets of, of, of sick ideas. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it, it's appalling to me that, it even ha and that opposition to that even has to be justified. Our entire mm -hmm. civilization is opposition to that. And so, I mean, we can let it go if we want, but the alternatives are far gloomier than what we have now, I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. So, we can let it all go. And we're being taught to let it all go. It's corrupt, it's rotten right to the roots, it needs to be retooled right to the very concepts that we use. It's like, yeah, what's going to replace it? Mm -hmm. What have we got that's better? We've got <laughs> nothing that's better. What we have is something that could be far more than it is if people would just take it to the level that it could be taken to. And everyone wants to hear that. And then, and it, well, and that's has been a very long answer. This is why 91% of the people that are watching my lectures <laughs> are men, as far as I can tell. Hmm. So, Dr. Peterson, I think we have time for one or two more questions, and we might open it up to Q and A. One more question, according to Connor. Um, and I want to end with it because you were talking about your experience as a clinical psychologist, and I'm wondering if you have any advice for students on general topics of like mental health, wellness at college. In a lot of ways, I think you have claimed that by finding more purpose, by finding more meaning, by contributing, one can develop more tolerance for oneself, one can develop more self-affirmation. I'm wondering, though, if you think there are cases where there are people with a lot of potential, especially at Harvard, who may doubt their abilities, who may get quite anxious. I'm sure you've interacted with students, with um, clients as a clinician. How do you, what advice do you give them, or what do you think college students should know about enhancing their psychological well-being at college. We've done we've done some research on that topic. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that really seems to help is to write out your plans for the future. Mm -hmm. We have a program, an online program called Future Authoring that we've used with about 10,000 university students now and raised their grade point average 25% and mm -hmm. dropped their dropout rate by about the same. Uh, it particularly works well for men who are generally underperforming women now, and so that I think it's raising them up. And it also works spectacularly well for non-Western ethnic minority men, which was also extraordinarily positive because, you know, that's that's well, that that was a great unexpected yeah. outcome. But in some of it is to aim at something that's worth aiming at. Yeah. You, and and how do you determine what's worth aiming at? You think, well, okay, here I have my miserable, wretched life. Under what conditions would it justify itself, as far as I'm concerned, personally? Like, under what conditions would my life justify itself? And so you, you think, well, what sort of future would I have to have so that I could say, this is worth it? And then that's what you aim for. Hmm. And, that, and technically that works in part because we know that most of the systems that mediate positive emotion in human beings, and so those would be the dopaminergic systems mm -hmm. that have their roots in the hypothalamic exploratory centers, are activated in relationship to the pursuit of a goal, not as a consequence of attaining something. Hmm. That's a consumatory reward system, but human beings mostly run on incentive reward. And so it appears that the higher the goal, the more kick you get from, from noting your progress towards that goal. Now, you have to be careful because you don't want to pick a goal that's so impossible that all you ever do is fail in relationship to it. That's an issue of self-management, right? You want, to, you want to pick a goal that moves you to the next plateau that you have a reasonable, a reasonable but not certain probability of attaining. So that's, that's part of it, is to, is to formulate a plan to decide who, 
who it is, what it is that you want to be, who it is that you want to be from a character logical perspective. And if you're having other problems, well, you know, some of that is when you're talking more on the clinical end of things, mm. is that again, the devil's in the details, but it's useful to talk to people, it's useful to write about what it is that you're up to. It, but it's it's most worthwhile to organize your life, I would say, and to and to pick a goal and to aim at it. That's that's a very nice way of starting to straighten things out for yourself. So but I mean, I would also say, like, I've had many clients, I often advocate the use of antidepressants. I mean, people, for example, people have all sorts of physiological mm -hmm. problems that compromise their movement forward, and those have to be addressed. I'm not saying that you can lift yourself up by your bootstraps mm -hmm. in every possible situation. I know that not be true. You, you take whatever interventions you need in order to allow yourself to continue moving mm -hmm. forward in the world. But, you know, and what do you do to try to set yourself up. Well, have some friends, that's helpful. Have an intimate relationship, try to make one that's reasonably permanent, that's helpful. Aim at having a family and children, aim at being useful to the community and turning yourself into something that's noble and respectable and powerful and, mm -hmm. and that'll, that'll help you orient yourself when, when you're young and because you'll start to see that you could have a life that was worth living, that you could be not proud of, that's the wrong way of thinking about it, but that you could live in a, the, the right way of phrasing it is that you could live in a manner that justifies the fragility of being. That's the right way to think about it. That's the right way to think about it. Because the fragility of being is a very powerful argument against its existence. And that, that's been recognized by, that was the, that was, that's the fundamental ethical dilemma investigated by Goethe, for example, in his, in his play Faust. Because Mephistopheles is the mouthpiece of everyone who says, being is so fragile that it should be eradicated because it produces too much suffering. It's Ivan Karamazov's argument in, mm. in, the, in the Brothers Karamazov. It's a very powerful argument. Why should any of this be? And the answer is, you justify it by how it is that, by how you, ex you justify being by how you choose to exist. Mm -hmm. And you can choose to exist in a manner that produces absolutely no justification whatsoever for being. Quite the contrary. But that's, that's not a pathway that I would recommend. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs>
Right, and, and it's, predicated on, it's predicated on something like faith in the fundamental nature of being. Because if you ally yourself to the degree that you can with the truth, then what you're doing is acting out the proposition that being is structured in the best possible manner. Because otherwise you wouldn't ally yourself with the truth. And if you decide to ally yourself with the truth, and you act in a manner commensurate with that, then your life will unfold in a particular way. And you have to take your chances if you're going to live like that. But the, the advantage to that is that, well, one advantage is you don't compromise yourself. And maybe you don't want to compromise yourself, because yourself is what you have to stave off the catastrophe of being. And if you compromise that, then you have nothing, except perhaps what other people will give you. It's a pathway to weakness. Now, I have a graduate student, as it happens, who is doing exactly that. We started doing empirical analysis of politically correct beliefs, and it's been absolutely fascinating. First of all, they do cohere. So the way we did it was we, we, we collected about 400 statements that were deemed by people in the press and so forth as indicative of politically correct belief. Mm -hmm. We did that agnostically, and this is a standard, a standard construct validation process in psychology, is that if you want to find out if something exists, you want to find out if the elements of that, that entity, say a, a, a domain of belief, co-varies, such that if you hold one belief, you're more likely to hold another belief. And so then you can pile up the beliefs that are likely to occur if one occurs. And the, the, the essential way to do that is to oversample the domain of beliefs, subject them to a factor analysis, and see how they cohere. And we found that there were two factors that were associated with politically correct belief, and that they were very powerfully predicted by personality, most particularly by trait agreeableness, which was not a predictor of conservatism or liberalism particularly. But, but more to the point, the student who's doing that um, her, name is, her, her name is Christine Brophy. She's a very brave girl, very, very tough girl. And uh, she's, she's pursued this forthrightly, and it's led to nothing but opportunity. Crazy amounts of opportunity. Now, it's a tough road to hoe. She knows perfectly well she's not going to be very popular in certain domains. But, but, but that's no reason not to pursue something. Mm -hmm. The issue is, are you interested in it? Do you want to find out the truth? Are you willing to pursue it? And are you willing to stake yourself on that? And if, if the answer is no, then you're not willing to stake yourself on yourself, and then God help you. Because you'll have to be given something by someone else to stake yourself on, and they can always take it away. Mm -hmm. So it's like, don't be, thinking, don't be thinking politically about your career. It's foolish. It doesn't work. It really doesn't work. You'll be second rate at best. You'll be second rate and frightened at best. You'll never hit the top ranks if you perform like that. And Having said that, I would also say, don't be an idiot. Don't make unnecessary enemies, right? Mm. I mean, there's no point in making unnecessary enemies. That's, that's not wise. Mm -hmm. But don't sell yourself short. You know, you might be on the cutting edge of an entire new domain of psychology if you actually get it right. And so maybe you won't be popular among your superiors for the time being. You can't talk to the people who are above you in a dominance hierarchy anyways. It's virtually impossible. <laughs> You can barely talk laterally. You pretty much have to broadcast your message down. And so the fact that, well, enough said about that. Yeah. No, it's a bad idea. Pursue your damn research. Tell the truth about it and let the chips fall where they will. Mm -hmm. You're much better protected that way than by doing anything else. Second question. Have universities been ruined by Marxism or rather by the massive growth of student life bureaucracies that seek to train rather than educate? They haven't been completely ruined, but the humanities and the social sciences are both in trouble. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Could you please speak to the legitimacy of Harvard's decision to penalize students for being part of single gender organizations that are not officially recognized by the university? Uh, for example, fraternities, sororities, and final clubs. It's cowardly. Hmm. It's cowardly. It's politically correct. It's, it interferes with freedom of association. So I would think they would have more important things to do. Mm -hmm. All right. Do you think, <laughs> do you think that victimhood narratives and critiques of oppression which make up much of the political discussion on college campuses are a symptom of a psychological need to deflect guilt because of, because of a lack of another better method of redemption. Yeah, I, I think that is part of it. I mean, uh, because I don't, I don't, it's not, 
I'm speaking more strongly in some sense than perhaps would be optimal, partly because time is short. I know that young people have a messianic urge. Piaget actually identified that as, as part of the developmental process uh, that, 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 was, that typified late adolescence. And it's admirable in many ways. It needs to be directed in the most powerful possible, powerful pro-social manner possible. Mm -hmm. And that's what the university should be doing. And by training students to be noisy, ill-informed, historically ignorant agitators, narcissistic agitators, let's add that, they're doing them a tremendous disservice. Like mm -hmm. when I was at McMaster, for example, where the last very vocal protest occurred, mm -hmm. mostly what I felt about the protesters was sorrow. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I looked out there, I saw, well, there's these, they're young people, they're university students, they're, they went to university, at least in principle, to learn something about themselves and about the world, and instead they've been transformed into these, like, they were chanting, they were chanting, like, um, what, profanities at me. I mean, really? That's the best you can do? You're, you come out in your dopey little group, you hide behind the hammer and sickle because of one of your fashionable professors convinced you that was a good idea, and the best you can do is organize yourself and chant profanities at me. You know, it's so mm -hmm. sad. These are, these are, they could be doing something better than that. I mean, God, come out and have a useful protest of some sort, at least. If you're going to come out and protest, make it a high quality protest, instead of like cursing at me in mm -hmm. repetitively. It's so dull and unimaginative and, and pathetic. And so, no, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> Eight more. Okay. <laughs> Five minutes. In cases where people have sworn chastity throughout life, under voluntary and non-coercive circumstances, is it possible to still develop fully and not suffer from the consequences of having never undergone sexual mat maturation? If so, how is it possible? <laughs> wow. <I> didn't, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't expect that one, I can tell you. Sometimes people have to make a sacrifice, right? And everyone always has to make sacrifices. I mean, that's actually something that I learned from reading mythology, because the ancient myths always talk about sacrifice, and people claim not to understand what that means. You always have to let go of something in order to progress into the future. In fact, that's the most fundamental discovery human beings ever made, as far as I can tell, because it's, it's exactly the same thing as discovering the future. And we discovered the future, right? We're the only creatures that we know of who really can conceive of the future. And the future is something that's made better by letting go of things in the present, right? That's impulse control. You can look at it that way if you want. The person who wrote this is obviously wrestling with something, you know, and maybe they're wrestling with a hyper-dominant sexual impulse that, 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 that threatens to be master instead of servant. And so who knows what they have to do in order to bring themselves under control? I would say that less radical solutions might first be advised, but I can, mm -hmm. right, because you don't have to, you don't want to whip yourself with a bigger whip than you need to use, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's minimal necessary force doctrine, essentially, but mm -hmm. so, yeah, so that's how I would answer that question. Yeah, pretty good for one you weren't expecting. <laughs> Dr. Peterson, you say that the meaning of life is to take an individual responsibility for the burdens of existence. If each person can justifiably choose his own way of taking on these burdens, then how can we prevent individuals from committing actions that are clearly moral injustices? Well, we can't. Hmm. I mean, they, that happens all the time. I think the best we, there's all sorts of mechanisms for regulating it, right? We have all mm -hmm. sorts of mechanisms for regulating it. Um, civil society and policing regulates it. Expectations between family members and friends regulate it. Your conscience regulates it. Um, but I don't believe that people do, as a general rule, commit illegalities or, or worse because they've taken on responsibility. Like, mm -hmm. that isn't how it works. 
pathway to criminality is not to be found in the adoption of responsibility. Mm. Right? You don't say that about criminals. Well, if he would have just taken on a little less responsibility, <laughs> then he wouldn't be in jail. No, that isn't how it works. Mm -hmm. So, what the question is more something like, well, if people are allowed to direct themselves, how do you stop them from picking a path that's, mm -hmm. that's improper? And yeah. I would say that, that and I, I do believe that that's the essential question. Yeah. And I would say, part of that is that if you're going to be self-directed, let's say, at least to some degree, then you have to tell the truth, because otherwise you pathologize yourself and you can't rely on your own judgment then. And that, that's part of the reason why the truth is so necessary, is that if you're going to use yourself as the mechanism by which you orient yourself in the world, then you better make sure that you're not transforming yourself into something that's predicated on error. Mm -hmm. And so, so it, the, 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 uh, the, the attempt to speak the truth is a, is a form of psychophysiological hygiene. That's one way of thinking about mm -hmm. it. And if, if you're oriented as well as you can towards the articulated truth, then you can increasingly rely on your own judgment. And that's, and that's, the, that's the best defense, say, against, against the dark side. Mm -hmm. hmm. You've attached a number of useful ideas. Ooh, this is a fun one. You've attached a number of useful ideas, for instance, self-overcoming, personal responsibility, to a viral meme, social justice conflict. How can we attach useful ideas to the social justice side of this controversy and convert it into a growthful movement for all involved? Well, I do think that is what's happening to some degree. I, I, I think hmm. that, the, that the political dialogue that's emerging is precisely that. I don't know how we can do it. I know what I know how I've been doing it to some degree. I've been doing it by saying what I think. Mm -hmm. and carefully, you know, and, and knowing that I'm prone to error and listening to feedback because I would like to know where I'm making errors. I had advisors, my friends, while I was undertaking this, who were telling me constantly everything I was doing that was second rate and, and egotistical and careless and all of those things. And so I would mm -hmm. say, I would say to some degree, maybe that question is spe specified at the wrong level of analysis, is that you should, you should learn to articulate mm -hmm. what you think, and that's what you have at your disposal. And, and with you people in the audience, man, you've got power at your disposal. You're all super bright and super conscientious, and mm -hmm. like, you know, your powerhouses, you might not know it, and maybe some of you have forgotten that because you've come to Harvard, and of course, so 50% of you are below average at Harvard, but that doesn't mm -hmm. mean that you're not like hyper capable because you're hyper capable. Mm -hmm. So get your act together and say what you think. And that'll do the trick, man. That'll 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 work just fine. Dr. Peterson, we're running out of time, so I'm gonna ask you one last question. I think it's an, an important one, especially for some of the people who don't think you should be speaking here today, whether some of them are in this room or some of them were outside earlier. The question reads, given extremely elevated violence and murder rates against trans people, why have you chosen to threaten a population that is already facing job discrimination, murder, et cetera? Oh, I'm not threatening them. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any evidence. The fact that a handful of noisy activists consider me a threat is no criteria of proof of any sort of anything. Mm -hmm. And I mean, so, so I just reject that entire, all, every single word in that question is meaningless as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. So people think, I, someone said, just because someone said that what I said is a threat to trans people does not make it true. Mm -hmm. And I have the, the testimony of a fair number of trans people that that's actually not only not true, it's palpably false. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, not guilty. Hmm. Very Canadian of you to apologize there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but not so much to say that I'm not guilty. Can I ask a follow-up question? Um, I, I suppose. So your, your talks at the University of Toronto have led to threats against trans students directly after. How do you take no responsibility for that violence? Well, first of all, I, I don't consider threats violence. So we have to be very careful when we use our words. So, so someone saying something and What's someone that? Try to keep it relatively are brief. Not, are not the same thing. And second, there's no possible way I can answer that question 
because I know nothing about the threats, I know nothing about who uttered them, I know nothing about who reported them. It's so, it's, your question is basically, some people said some bad things after I talked. It's like, could be, but I have no idea what to do about that, and I don't take responsibility for it. It's not specific enough to take responsibility for it. Okay, sorry, um, we do, we, the Hupti officers have to go home. Um, I appreciate that you have an opinion, but at some point, um, at some point we do need to call the day. Um, thank you, Akash and Professor Peterson, so much.